Hi, friends, and welcome to the Business of Story. I'm your host, Park Howell, author of Brand Bewitchery, that teaches you how to wield the story cycle system to craft spell-binding stories for your brand. But it's not just for brands. Businesses have used it to help their people internally communicate better. Sales teams have used it to help grow their sales and their impact in the world. Even HR development professionals have used it for their diversity and inclusion initiatives. So grab your copy on either Amazon, you can get a Kindle version there as well, or iBooks, and start putting the power of the story cycle system to work for you today. Now, on today's show, we are going to explore SPACE, or at least the acronym of S-P-A-C-E, created by Scott Page, an accomplished musician whose saxophone and rhythm guitar work with such bands as Pink Floyd, Super Tramp, and Toto has led to a remarkable entrepreneurial career with several successful tech companies he started and, well, took to fame in their own right. Today, we're going to be looking at how his world of music and musicianship, and being on all the largest stages has impacted him as a storyteller and the lessons that he's learned, especially about being present in the moment and how that can impact your business. As crazy as it seems, the most important thing business-wise was me taking that inward journey, getting to the point where I could be more aware, because it's really about awareness. It's about being aware, because when you're aware, you listen better, your mind's not zipping off in a million directions. For me, I find it way more productive, and it's helped my business, because it basically attracts things, because I'm not trying to force anything anymore. I go into anything not really caring whether it happens or it doesn't happen, which is kind of odd, you think, right? Because if it doesn't happen, it doesn't matter. Something else will happen. Scott is currently CEO of Think EXP, a Los Angeles-based media company focused on live immersive entertainment. He's worked on and led a number of ventures, including Walt Tucker Productions, an audio-video post-production company that produced projects for the likes of the Rolling Stones, Bon Jovi, Janet Jackson, Garth Brooks, and many more. He co-founded 7th Level Inc., a CD-ROM game and educational software company where he co-produced Toonland, an interactive musical cartoon starring Howie Mandel and featuring Pink Floyd's David Gilmore. He also worked with Bonnie Python and created their interactive series and was integral to the development of QD7, an interactive multimedia joint venture with Quincy Jones and David Salzman. And he'll bring you up to speed on everything else he's been up to. So please welcome to the Business of Story, Scott Page. Scott, welcome to the show. Hey, Park, nice to meet you and hang out with you, and I'm very thankful to be here. Thanks to our brother, Shep, who uh, put us together here, so I'm very excited about this. Old Shep hiking. Yeah, he's uh, he was on the show a couple weeks ago, and he's such a such a delight. So much uh, fun having him around. Great guy. Great guy. One of my favorite people, and he's a good guitar player. You know, we play some gigs and stuff together, so it's always fun. I We did the National Speakers Association a while back, and that was a lot of fun. Great wow. guy. Well, that's great. You know, um, he told me that he missed his birthday party out there because of COVID and he was coming out to SoCal to jam with all of you guys. And he was just absolutely heartbroken. He couldn't do that. Oh, I know. It's He loves to play. You know, that's one thing about Shep. We, we not only with the Speaker Association, we did social media world together. And uh, when he came out here, you know, all of, all of our music buddies, uh, we're all we're getting ready to go do his big birthday hang and we got hung up. That's but we a will do it again, I'm sure. And our other mutual friend, Kenny Aronoff, the hardest hitting man in show business. We love Kenny. Kenny's one of my best bros. Yeah, I love him. And he's fun to play with, man. You talk about a great drummer. Boy, that guy is smoking good. I had him on the show, oh gosh, almost 20 shows ago, show number 277. And what I love so much about him is not only his energy, how he's pivoted at what the rightful age of 65 or something and is still one of the most sought after session drummers in music but 
his bigger message about having that brand purpose and and letting that purpose drive and guide everything that you do is just a powerful show. And one of the reasons I was mentioning that to Shep is that this year, 2021, I am looking to do more exploration in the music world with highly, highly accomplished musicians like yourself, Kenny and others, about how music for you has transformed and translated over into business, because mm. you're a very accomplished entrepreneur too, and we'll be covering that here in a little bit. But first and foremost, you grew up in a musical family, had a famous you know, musician father. Yep. And what have you learned in all this is what I want to explore today, is what can our listeners take from what you know about communicating and connecting with an audience through music that they could apply and their day-to-day -day work in their business, whether they're B2B service offering or product offering or a consultant. Um, what do you know about storytelling that we need to know about? Well, first of all, everything is about storytelling because in order to rise above the noise, you got to have a very compelling story. I mean, everything in business is, is about the story, even in the startup phase. If you don't have a great story in the startup phase, you're never going to get funded. If you don't have a real, a, a real play that makes sense, and it is about the story and about the people and about the team. Yeah, I mean, everything I do is really... It is about telling a story. It's even telling a story when I play my instrument, right? It's not just like playing a bunch of notes, but it's trying to take people on a journey when they're actually, when you're listening, you know, so you're, you're creeping around, playing across the changes and, you know, kind of those things. So storytelling to me is probably one of the most important things. I actually teach a course called SPACE, which stands for Story, Plan, Army, conversion education. And it's kind of a business formula that I've used. And I usually, I teach a lot of artists this because I believe this is the greatest time in history right now for the independent artist. And, you know, this shakeup in COVID has completely shifted the model and giving great opportunities. And the first thing I try to tell them is that everything is about story. Because if you, like you said, if you don't have a great story, you'll never be able to rise above the noise. And I try to explain to him, it's not the story of like, gee, I was, I was born in Cincinnati and I, I grew up a guitar player. Nobody cares about that story. They want to know what is your purpose? What do you stand for? You know, what is, what, what's problems are you solving? And, you know, when I talk to artists about problems, they like go, well, what do you mean problems? I just want to sit around, smoke fatties and play my guitar and write some songs. Well, I said, you know, those days are kind of over <laughs> as far as the music business is now. And you, you have to really, uh, really think like an entrepreneur, but you know um, you know, I was trying, I was thinking about this uh, you know, a big part of the story for me in music and how it's helped me is, is music's made me really focus a lot. Uh, it's hard to explain, but it, it's kind of, it's kind of like diving in deeper to something that's more closer to the soul. And you can tell when you've got a great story and you've got, you've got passion behind that story. And that's what really helps sell this stuff. But yeah, no music has been uh, one, one thing about music that is, is great is it teaches you how to focus, right? Because when you're playing music, you go into the zone, right? When you're really playing and you're telling a great story in the way you play, you actually get in the zone. So, you know, I, it, you know, it's not necessarily words, but it's, it has to do with, you know, the music side of things and telling a story in a different way. Well, let me ask you about that for a second, because I've been playing the piano since I was a little kid and I never, you know, had the, the talent or maybe the tenacity to take it to that level where you are now. But it seems to me that any musician is you first have to work on the mechanics, right? You, your your yeah. technique, your ability, your muscle memory. And when you're learning a song, especially when you're young and building, and maybe this is an entrepreneur uh, metaphor here, is that you have to go through and perfect the mechanics and get the basics down so that when you do perform, when you get to that level of finding flow, you're no longer thinking about mechanics, right? That's Correct. already baked in. Now you are just letting the music flow through you. Is that, yeah. is that oh, fair absolutely. enough? Absolutely. I mean, the, the point is, is you want to forget all the mechanics. You don't want to be thinking. You know, it's interesting, you know, when you talk about that flow, you know, for many years, I used to, re uh, every night when I was playing gigs growing up, I would 
play the gig at night and I'd record myself every night, right? And when I'd record, I would then put it in the car on my way home and listen back as a critique, see if I was flat, sharp, you know, if I was rushing, dragging, how my lines, you know, just to basically see where I was going. And I remembered there was a very interesting thing is over about a 10 year period of time, there was like five or six times that I remember getting in the car and throwing that tape in and just going, holy crap, how, I, I can't believe that's me. I played stuff that I'd never played before, right? I had no idea uh, what had happened. And I've always tried for years trying to kind of figure that out. Then when I took, I, I, you know, consciousness is actually my favorite subject on the planet. And so I got very deep into a heavy meditative lifestyle and really focusing on finding, you know, that inner journey. I realized from meditating that what had happened at those times is I stopped thinking, right? Thought had dropped and something else was happening. So for me now, when I go play, I go into a state where I actually now, after years of meditating, I finally learned what it means to stop thought. And if anybody says that, what's the greatest thing you've ever learned? I said, I can stop thinking now, which is really trippy because it's not a simple thing to figure out. But I realize now when I go to play, that I go into this zone where I can actually stop my thought and just kind of let it happen. You know, I let go of all the mechanics and all the education, all those things, and just kind of let it happen. And so uh, I, I always equated it. It's, it's like for me, when I get to go play, it's like I get to get closer to the source or God or, uh, you know, whatever universal thing you want to talk about. And I think that applies to anything. I mean, in business, again, when the more present you are, the more you're awake you are when you're having conversations, you're listening better. You're uh, you're absorbing things better. You're not trying to uh, manipulate things in the same kind of way. You're much more receptive, and I find that that's a you know a very important thing that's I've carried over from music into business, right? So, and I think it's important in the story side when you are communicating and talking about your business is to practice. I mean, practice telling the story, share it with everybody, find all these different stories that you have, and you know bounce them off your wife or husband or significant other, your family, your friends, your colleagues, your shareholders, your stakeholders, your vendors, keep telling and retelling that story and see how it morphs depending on who your audience is, yeah. as long as you remain truthful to it and authentic in it. But get to the point that when you're in a pitch and you're under fire, where yeah. everybody else in the room and maybe even your colleagues might start to crumble a little bit, that you can get to the point where you are not thinking and you are just articulating your story and let it come from a different place. Not yeah. your head, but really from your heart. Well, that's the thing. When you really tell a story that you truly believe in and you have, you tell it differently, right? Your passion comes in, right? It's a, it's a different zone that you're in when you go to pitch something when you know that it's right. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the same. Like, it's like when writing a song, when we write a song, I remember uh, one night we were writing a song and I could tell that it was a hit. You could just, you could just tell that it was, it what was, was right song? because, because it, it, it was called too many times. And, uh, we, uh, well, we got to number two on the charts, we almost number one, number one in the country, but number two on the charts. We knew at that moment. And it's the same thing in business. I just, you know, when your story about your business is right on because you resonate differently with it, it's a lot easier to tell because you're so passionate and because you're, you're the way you tell your story, the people on the other end can feel that yeah. thing. So I know when I go into a pitch, it's no different than when I'm getting up and picking up my saxophone and I'm going for it, right? It's that same kind of energy and the same type of feeling that I have in my body and that resonance that happens when I know that I feel great about what I'm going into pitch because I know that the the story I'm about to tell is is honest and it's got integrity and it and it feels passionate, right? We're going to get to your entrepreneurial side here in a minute. First, let's share a little bit about your backstory because your dad was Bill Scott, who played no, Bill in Page. The, Bill Page. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, Bill Page. You're Scott Page. He's I'm Bill Scott, Page. He's Bill. Bill Page. Yeah. In the, in the you know legendary Lawrence Welk band and some yeah. a little bit on the Johnny Carson show. So you were born into a, a musical family. Question yeah. here is how much of your success is due to Nurture. I mean, you were born into it, so they taught you, plus talent, perseverance, and even opening doors. And so if you could take us from where you began in your musical career and some of the great things that you accomplished in the process. Well, yeah, first of all, I, I did come from a musical family, and I got, I really 
truthfully, I, I won the lottery for parents, right? I'm, I am the most thankful person in the world. My, my mom and dad were just the best parents you could ever imagine. My dad took me everywhere. What was interesting about my father, not only was he a world-class musician, you know, he was not only did Lawrence Welk, but he was, in, you know, NBC staff and did a lot of shows and stuff through the years, but he was a serial entrepreneur. Like, you know, when I was growing up, we had boat businesses, candy businesses. We had 26 donut shops at one time. Uh, we had a lighting company. We had, uh, my dad was one of the inventors of the wah-wah pedal, you know, the famous oh, yeah. guitar pedal. For the guitar, wah, and, wah, wah. Yeah, Actually, he recorded the very first recording of that pedal, which was called the wah-wah doozy, and it was on a bassoon. And it was originally designed not for guitars, but for wind instruments. So that's a kind of an interesting story, but yeah. So my father was a big influence on me in, in uh, and during that time, I really wasn't into music. I, I took up the trumpet. I was a trumpet player when I was a young kid, but I didn't really take it very serious. And I only did it for my father at the time. Uh, just cause he, you know, he wanted me to play cause he thought music was good for me, but I was really in design and architecture and stuff. And I was studying through school, through junior high and high school. I was a draft. I was studying drafting and architecture and those things. And I ended up getting a job with a company called Audiodyne where I was drawing exploded views of, 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 of machine parts and things like that. And those were the days when you had to use a pencil and a pen. And, uh, so, but all that time I was always with my dad and he was always instilling, you know, he was one of those guys that was always on time, like crazy. I mean, he would never miss a minute, man. He was just the most dependable kind of person that he met. So he was very instrumental in really helping me move, uh, uh, kind of my career. Uh, and I, I really, what happened is I got in a band with, uh, those, uh, Jeff Beccaro and David Page when we were kids, which were the founders of Toto later on, but we had a kid band called the merciful soul band. And we, we, uh, it was, a. I was the worst guy in the band. I was the second trumpet player, but we started winning all the battle of the bands and everything. And then all of a sudden I realized in the front row, there was girls and my drafting job was no girls, right? It was like, I'm sitting there, a cup of coffee, <laughs> lots of cups of coffee. So I realized, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to be a musician. And that's where I really kind of flipped around and decided to be a, a, a musician. And then I put my whole heart and everything in that. Uh, and then it was really about taking, I used my drafting skills. I became a music copyist for, for a few years to basically support myself because I wasn't good enough as a musician to really get any gigs. And what's a and, copyist, a music copyist? Well, in, in those days, we didn't have computers. And what we'd do is the composer would use a score. You know, there was a big score sheet. And you'd have the trumpets, trombones, saxophones, all the instruments on one sheet. And he'd write it and it'd be like, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 staffs and he would hand me that uh and then i'd have to go copy the trumpet part out trumpet one then copy trumpet two out so there were individual parts for the musicians to read in the studio so he would work all night he'd call me up at two o'clock in the morning i'd copy all night and then i'd get up and deliver it to the recording session hopefully no mistakes because you'd get beat up if you had a but if you miss notes or forgot flats and sharps because in those days every minute in the studio was costing money and they had to knock these things out so um i ended up using those skills to kind of get me through. So it was design. And then I got into music and I really started studying that. And then, you know, my career started to take off. I got in a band called Seals and Crofts. I don't know if you remember them. Oh, yeah. Summer oh, Breeze yeah. and all that stuff. And I toured with them around the world. And uh, that was the beginning. And then from there, I kind of went on to, oh my God, you know, I played with everybody from uh, Chuck Berry to, to James Brown to Mick Fleetwood. I was in Mick Fleetwood's band. Then I moved on. I got in Super Tramp and played with Super Tramp for many years, did three albums, then did Toto. I ended up going back to Toto. So I got to work with my friends who took off and which was my big motivation because they did so well. And I always wanted to, uh, you know, up my game uh, to get to that point. So when I got called to play with them, that was one of the most exciting things. I felt like I had actually gotten to a point where I was good enough to play with those guys. And then I moved on and uh, went over and played with Pink Floyd for quite a few years. And so, you know, that was kind of my journey. So as, as nature and nurture, you, you had great parents that helped you yep. get through this and show up yep. and be accountable and do your thing. And how much of it, it was talent though? Do you feel like you inherited a great deal of talent from your dad? You know, actually to be truthful, you know, I know guys that were my heroes that were like, you know, they could pick up any instrument, play it. They had time was great. 
they were fast and learning for me. I was, I, I don't, didn't have that talent, man. Mine was like hours and hours of woodshedding. And I really focused on, because I really never had the chops. Like a lot of these guys, you know, can play all over the place. And I decided that it was more about, it was more important. What I learned that it was more important what you say than what you play. So I started realizing that all my great, the great musicians that I'd played with, the guys that knocked me out the most were the guys that played melodies and played things people could recognize. So my whole thing was really about trying to become more of a stylist. I'm more of a stylist player where uh, I'm not like the guy that has, you know, can play a million, you know, play giant steps and bebop tunes and all that. And I decided, you know, where's my, where's my niche? And I realized that rock and roll was a space that there was kind of wide open. Cause it was funny. I was thinking about it when I was saying like, you know, man, the competition is crazy out there. And, you know, I could name every jazz guy, you know, all, Fathead Newman, Lockjaw Davis, Ben Webster, I Quebec, uh, uh, you know, Charlie Parker, Cannonball Adderley, Dexter Gordon. I could name all those. And then I said, well, what about rock and roll guys? And then I went, you know, you'd go Junior Walker, Clarence Clemens, uh, King Curtis, and then it starts to go who? And that's when I decided to, uh, you know, really go focus on the rock and roll space. And I really went and designed a style. I, I, I kind of developed a style. So I would do things a little different where I feel like the most important thing was just putting every bit of ounce of every time you pick up your horn, you're playing like you're playing for, you know, the biggest concert you ever played in your life. So my whole thing is really about attitude and about trying to do things when everybody else went right, I would go left. Right. And so I, instead of, you know, the normal, I'd go, I'm trying to put attitude into it. And because of that, it was like I created a style because I, I really believe creating your own sound and sort of wearing your own clothes is really the key. What makes you unique? What makes you different? And it's not about a lot of chops and a lot of stuff, because if you look at all the great players, I mean, if you look at BB King, he's not a big bebop jazz kind of guy, he plays the blues, but those notes that he plays and how he plays him and with so much soul is really the, the key to the whole thing. You had a seminal moment that you had told me about where you saw style on display and it was like an awakening for you and you realized that uh, you had to do the same thing for your career. Would you mind sharing that with our listeners? My whole thing is I'm very curious, right? I think curiosity is really very important. I had just finished doing a bunch of recording here in Los Angeles and I, I got a call to go do a tour with Diana Ross. And I was like, well, do I really want to go on the road? But I, I wanted to get a new recording console and I wanted, needed some money. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go out. So I went on the road and I ended up going to a New York and we're at rehearsal and stuff. And she ends up walking in the room. And now at that time I had actually played with quite a few celebrities and, you know, you kind of get past the whole thing of being too much awe anymore. Cause you find out that all these people are just people like you, right? It's, but it's, you know, it's, it's strange, but she came in the room and for some reason, I could not take my eyes off of her. She had such magnetism about her and such a unique thing and everybody you could see there was something going on because my my whole thing is i i always look for patterns like i i focus on patterns i i try to find repeatable patterns right and that's kind of why i'm a big lean startup guy i like to find things that are you know what are those things to, to to find the simplest thing that can actually work and you base it on patterns repeatable processes right so i ended up watching her. i couldn't believe how i was just so stunned and taken by her at that thing so i remember the first night on the gig we got up and we're playing that night and i was playing in a horn section there was four horns in there and um I, I couldn't take my eyes off her and I was making a million mistakes. I was missing because I was reading a chart, right? I was looking at the charts. And I was trying to look at her. So I remember going back, this isn't any good. So the next two days, I, in my day, the time during the day, I just memorized the book so I wouldn't have to look at it again. And I started watching her and started looking for patterns. And I started to realize that, you know, it didn't matter every night she could get 16,000 people on their feet. It didn't matter if she was having a good night or she was, uh, you know, her voice was good or whatever. There was just something about specific things that she would do. So I was watching her every night as she would do this and she would do certain things. And big part of it was her style, right? It wasn't that she was a great 
a, like the greatest dancer, not like JLo, which is a hardcore dancer, right? She was dance. She moved good, but the way she held herself and the way she stood and the way she, you know, she posed, she was almost like watching a statue at times, you know, there was just something very elegant about what she did. So I started seeing those things. And the other things that I would watch her do is, you know, she would pick somebody in the front row, right? And I'd, she'd make sure she drilled them you know, communicate, even with presentations, you want to make sure you communicate with people. So looking in their eyes and getting across. So she, she looked at them and she, they'd see her and they'd be like, Oh, wow, she's paying attention to me. And she'd acknowledge them. And then she'd find somebody over here and she would acknowledge them. Then she'd find somebody over here and she acknowledge them and she'd go through the whole stadium. And in the back where they were, people were so small, she'd look for somebody with a sign, right? And they'd hold up the sign and she'd be, Oh, you with the sign, right? And by that time, she just lifted the whole audience up, right? So I realized that her thing and her style about the way she stood uh, was another big part because it, sometimes she would just stand there, but the angles on her body were so great. So I remember that night I said, man, I got to do something. So I went the next day I went to the, cause you have the strap around your neck usually, you know, that you're where you're the saxophone, saxophone. You're kind yeah. of stuck in a position. Yeah. You can't do anything. So I went to guitar to the guitar store in the town we were in and I found a, a stretch guitar strap and I created a strap that I could put around me so that it could stretch and I could kind of move it out of my way so that I, and I'd stand, I remember standing in front of the mirror, man, standing there trying to make sure my shoulders were angled, pushing the saxophone down to the side and kind of really getting that style. And then I realized too, that she, her hair was like so flowing and the lights would catch it. So I remember I had, grew my hair at the time. I said, I got to have long hair because that's a big part of this game. Uh, and I remember I had one of the, I had one of the longest, coolest mullets in the history of <laughs> mankind. You know, <laughs> it's hilarious that I actually had one of those haircuts because I hated my hair. I wanted my sh short hair in the front because it used to drive me crazy. So I grew it out in the back. But anyway, she was, uh, she really just taught me a lot about, about, you know, Patterns of things to do, you know, looking at those those things that constantly work and really think about style. And she was she was epitome of style for sure. I loved her. She she taught me a lot. So it goes back to what you were saying about you have to have your own sound, wear your own clothes, and be your own man or woman on stage. And there's always going to be someone better than you around. And, and you know yeah. what? Quite a bit better too. But if you show up your as your authentic self, then you can own that stage as well, right? Well, yeah. I mean, here's the deal. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a really good example of that, right? Because I don't care who's, who's going to play. I know if I go stick it out there as hard as I can, man. And I mean, I, like, it's like, you know, when we were playing with, with Pink Floyd, you know, I'd always stand back when it was Gilmore solos and he's up on the front of the stage. When it was my turn, man, I'd go right out to the front. And if he was on the stage, I'd hang my toes over the end of the stage so that I was the center of the freaking focal point. And man, I just like, I just stick it out there so hard. It wasn't nice necessarily playing a million notes it didn't even make any it didn't even matter if i made some mistakes it was just more about that moment of 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 a presence where you're just putting it out there so hard that you know i could go play with guys a lot of guys that'll just like kill me tear me apart with chops and stuff like this but i'll go out there and i'll just stick it out there so hard in a way simplified and it relates to people people relate to that energy right yeah, I can hear the energy right now, and you know, in you and the passion after all these years. So you had a very successful career in rock and roll and, and music. When did you decide that maybe you wanted to really start diving into the entrepreneurial side of life? And is that how much of your dad influenced you in that process? Oh, I think he was a major influence because that's just kind of, it was my lifestyle. I was just, I, I just became, I started as an entrepreneur, right? It was one of those things because that's how our, my family lived. We were in an entrepreneurial state all the time, right? That's what we did for years. So for me, it wasn't really anything different. I just moved into that. But, uh, you know, for me, I, what really started happening was in 19, oh my gosh, well, I forget what year it was now. Anyway, I started a company called Walt Tucker back in the days named after my two heroes, Walt Disney and Preston Tucker, the car manufacturer. I love their pioneering spirit. And, you know, I still look at Disneyland as an, in an incredible uh, user experience that you, everybody can model in their businesses. You know, it's, it's credible how, how that place is built when you start analyzing it all. Well, this was a post-production company. This was your first foray into entrepreneurship. Yeah. So Walt Tucker was a, uh, was a audio video post and merchandising company. So I had a graphics merchandising. 
And that was my real first foray into it. But I was playing and I was at the same time working on productions and building a business at the same time. And then I ended up seeing um, uh, all this multimedia come along. I was actually, I did my first CD-ROM in 1990. And that was called Music Bytes. And it was the very first CD that was designed for computer users to use as presentation music. Because, you know, PowerPoint was out. And this was on 386, 25 megahertz machines. You know, this is back in the day, right? <laughs> and um, so we did this thing called Music Bytes so that, you know, if you were doing a presentation, you could drop this in. They were WAV files and you could drop them into your presentation. So myself and Jeff Baxter, who did this with me from the Doobie Brothers, and we put an all-star band together to create this music for this thing. We were at Comdex, and, um, which was the trade show in Vegas, which became CES. At the time, it was the world largest computer technology show. And I was sitting there, we were playing, demoing our stuff. And I went and looked across the room and I saw something on a screen and I walked up to that thing on the screen and it was this educational title, a CD-ROM called Just Gram On Me. And it was the first time that I ever saw you could click on an object and it would move. And I went, man, that's the space. This is the, this is the future right here. So at that point, I really shifted everything, my whole, every, everything I was doing, dove into that thing. I used to hang out in the cyber scene with all the cyber punks and guys in garages, you know, when they were coding in garages and stuff. And I was hanging out with Timothy Leary. We'd be doing the digital B-ins and, you know, Thomas Dolby and myself and Todd Runwin were kind of the early, early, early adopters back in 1990, 91, kind of a time frame in that space. And um, so that really got me into the tech so technology side of things. So I really, my career has been uh, as a tech tech sort of executive and founder. I'm on my fourth company now. Um, I took one of them seventh level where I did the world's first. I My favorite thing that I'm very proud of is uh, myself, along with a guy named Richard Merrick, we directed and produced the world's first interactive cartoon. And it was called Toon Land and it starred Howie Mandel. And uh, uh, we sold 11 million units of that. And that title was able got us to go public and we took the company and we were uh, we built that so from there i've been a tech executive and i've been heavily in technology that's what i still am also and crossing that in between of being an entertainer and technology because you know i mean the thing about uh, technology is this it's like when you're dealing with programmers it's either they want it very precise. It's either on or off. It's either yes or it's no. There's none of this, well, maybe thing, you know, like as an artist, you're going to go, well, let's try this. Maybe you want to do this. The last thing they want to hear is, hey, let's try this. No, no, let's go try this. No, let's go try this. That does not work in technology. These guys want it figured out, very clean, because you can burn a lot of time and just burn people out if you don't know. So my whole career has really been kind of around that. And like my new company now, Think Experience is really, uh, we're building a platform of the live experience tied to the online uh, kind of audience management platform for uh, kind of this new real-time two-way stuff that's going on. So, uh, yeah, I've been a, you know, pretty much a serial entrepreneur uh, pretty much all my life. You know, when I was a kid, I had, you know, I had did paper routes and, you know, tried selling different things when I was a kid. I had a mm -hmm. graphics company and, you know, just been doing this for all my life. So I've just been a serial entrepreneur. So you had mentioned as a, a musician, you looked for patterns and of yep. course you, you, you get the mechanics down so you can forget about the mechanics and get into flow. What are some of the skills as a musician you have used to great effect in business that uh, maybe some of us could put to, to work without having to be a famous musician in the first place? A lot of guys go wide. I take something and I go very deep. So an example would be is when I was learning to play the saxophone, my teacher and myself, we would sit there for hours and play the same four bars or eight bars of music to the point like we would take a famous solo and we would sit down and we would play it over and over and over again. And what happens is, is your attention changes, right? It, I think everything is about attention. Because when you're all over the place, it's kind of hard to be creative. So getting attention. So we would take those songs and we would play it till it sounded like there was no difference in one person. By doing that, you start seeing the little subtle things, right? So music has really t attuned my perception on small detail things where I think the magic happens in those little details. Because everybody can kind of put the pieces together, but it really comes down to that last little tiny bit of magic. And so music has been really more about turn, tuning my 
perception on how I look at things or how I observe things or how I observe, you know, how I, how I approach things. So I, I approach everything in music and music is also deals in, in, in patterns. In other words, uh, you know, an eight bar phrase, a four by phrase, uh, those type of things. And now when, you know, when you're working on a, a project, uh, I think about that the same way. I think about it in, in chunks and p- little pieces and uh, a book that changed would change my life was a guy named Sid Fields uh, wrote this book called Screenplay, and Screenplay was really about the mechanics of screens. He was a uh, script reader guy. That's what his job was. And he read 200, 200 plus scripts. And, you know, he picked and he analyzed like Chinatown and all these, you know, all the great movies. And what he found was there were serious patterns, like a certain amount of time would happen. And then there'd be a pivot point at that point. And then another piece would happen. And it'd be a pivot point. So that related to me because it's the same thing in music. You do your eight bars and you do another, then you repeat the eight bars and then you might do a four bar shift to another chord and then another four bars, but it's all in chunks of patterns. So music gave me that thinking, looking at Sid Fields gave me that. And it's the same way I approach everything I do in my business. I mean, I use the Sid Fields for writing screenplays when I'm writing a plan for my company, right? It's exact same process. And even if I'm doing a presentation, I'm thinking about the presentation where I'm going to go. And then at that specific time, I just know that that's the place that I need to twist it at a moment and then move it to another place to keep moving people through the process. And there's a rhythm to all that as well. A rhythm to building a business, a rhythm to a presentation. And like you say, you're taking them along. You know, you might have a verse, chorus, verse, chorus in a presentation, and you realize you just have taken your audience as far as you can with this line of thinking. So you throw in a bridge and you, you take throw them somewhere yeah. completely different for a very quick amount of time. They're like, whoa, where are we? And then you come back to the familiar again. You know, I, I studied music composition in theory. And I have used what I learned in that and studying all those great composers, you know, Bach and Chopin and Mozart and all that. In my career, my 35-year career in advertising and marketing and writing, and it gets to the point that it is an absolute rhythm. And you know when your sentence has gone too long or you know when you're missing a beat here and there and you just feel it after a while. And that's what music does because like when we play, you know, when I'm just soloing, we get so used to feeling those, there's natural places where things move. There's natural chord progressions. So you hear a song and you can already, I can already hear where it's going because of where the natural progression is going. So that is the same logic and thinking that it pries to business and ties to presentations and starts. It's the same thing when, if I'm doing a launch plan right? I'm, I'm thinking the same kind of way. I'm going to bing, 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 and then I'm going to zing them with one and <laughs> bing, 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 and then I'm going to zing them with one, right? It's okay, like, Scott, how- but, but, but what if our listener out there does not have the music background? They've never played. How can, what, what can they learn from you that they could start applying right now in their own world? Well, uh, you know, this is going to sound a little odd. The most important thing that I've ever learned, and I've it's really this last sort of 10 years. And this goes back to taking that inward journey. It's about being, it's about presence, right? It's about, which is kind of an odd thing because let's think of it this way. You and me right now, the only thing that's real is you and me talking. That's it. Two minutes ago is not real anymore. It's just, it's a thought. Two minutes from now is just a thought, right? So the point I'm making is that everything happens. The only thing that's real is right now and I can get lost in thought and go all kinds of different places. But when I'm more present to where I'm, where I, when I'm really awake, so to speak, that's where the, the ideas come from. The, 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 the all the secret sauce comes in that space when you're not worried about what's going on in the future, what's going on in the past. It clouds your mind. So I, I, for me, for my business, the most important thing was that inward journey because once I realized that, I ended up not forcing things anymore, right? I don't go into meetings anymore trying to make something happen so much that I'm going to try to manipulate the conversation and kind of move things in that way. I go in there, just try to be totally straight with the conflict. Is it works? Great. If it doesn't work, great. Because it doesn't matter. 
something else will happen, right? We get too caught up as business people in the vision of where we're going. And it's really about the ride. I mean, it's great to have the goal and where you want to go. But what happens is a lot of times you'll have your goal and then you start, the goal starts to shift because we all of a sudden things have to be, and then you freak out because, well, wait a minute, it's not happening the way that I thought it was going to happen. So, you know, as crazy as it seems, the most important thing business-wise was me taking that inward journey, getting to the point where I could be more, more aware because it's really about awareness. It's about being aware because when you're aware, you listen better. You're not being, your mind's not zipping off in a million directions and you're just more, for me, I find it way more productive and it's helped my business because it basically attracts things because I'm not trying to force anything anymore. I don't force, I don't, I go into anything not really caring whether it happens or it doesn't happen, which is kind of odd, you think, right? Because if it doesn't happen, it doesn't matter. It, something else will happen. How much of that thinking comes from your experience of being on stage and you're playing in front of a large, you know, crowd and they're screaming their heads off and something goes haywire with the song or someone takes a solo in a completely different place you weren't expecting or someone starts messing with you, the lead singer turns back and all of a sudden throws it in your lap and you've got to run with it where if you're not present, you have totally blown it. Well, what a lot of times that'll throw you into presence, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, whoa, what happened? And now you're awake for a minute. Where am I? You just got something thrown at you, right? Boop, uh oh. Uh, so uh, that's what actually creates it. I love that. It's, I, I, you know, it's, it's controlled spontaneity is how I run my businesses and everything. I like to try to take things. I know kind of what I'm expecting it to be, but I just like to throw things, throw it in the middle and let it happen. Right. And create that spontaneity because what I've learned in, in music it, it is that, you know, I found that usually the first or second take when I'm recording has magic in it. It's just totally different because I'm not all figuring it out in my head and trying to make it fit and everything. I'm just letting it out. And I feel the same way about that when I work with my businesses and my, and my, the people I work with, I try to create some kind of a moment where I can actually create some chaos and see what happens. Right. Uh, I think that's very important uh, because if you try it, if everything's just like this, you kind of lose that that and it's also it creates an environment for the people in the company to be a, to put them on their toes and make them think also <laughs> hey we started this show you had mentioned the acronym of space oh, story yeah. plan army i think you said in the army I missed, would you take conversion us, would education you, would you take us through those five steps for our audience yeah so s space is what for me is uh, i believe this is the the, the kick-ass business formula and it works for virtually any business and um so think about it this way as you know story is everything everything starts with the story because it's how you rise above the noise and like i said earlier it's not about where i'm from or what i've done or things like that nobody cares about that they care about what's your purpose what do you stand for what what is that right so your story is critical and not only just critical about your uh, 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 for your where, where your business is, but it's it's critical because it also gives you keywords and phrases and stuff that we can growth hack against. Because once my story is there, I can now go and find my audience. I can go find the people that care about a specific story. So we talk about the story because everything once the story is there, everything falls out from that point on. I, I can't. I don't do anything unless I get the story straight first, right? It's really, really important to me because once that's there, I know that I've got the right purpose, the thing that I'm going from. Then the next thing we go to plan. So plan is where I, I talk about the whole lean startup principles. You know, the whole thing of lean startup is, you know, uh, fail fast so that you can pivot quickly and not waste a lot of time. You know, uh, don't run out of resources and make sure you test and validate everything before you throw all your resources on there. So the plan is a a critical piece of it. The story feeds that plan. And we use the lean startup principles. I, I tell people too, if there's anybody out there, one of the greatest tools out there is called the lean canvas. And it's basically a one page business plan. And I use that all the time. That's one of my favorite tools, nine questions, answer those questions. And one thing that's really nice about that, uh, that lean canvas, it doesn't only why, once you answer this question, it doesn't only tell you what you're going to do. What it does is it tells you more what you're not going to do, right? Because the idea is you want to do this with lean is you want to do the smallest thing you can possibly do to give you the biggest amount of bang, 
right? You don't want to build, boil the ocean. And boy, I've done that where I overbuilt things so much and then nobody cared, right? It was like you wasted all this time and all this money doing something. So it's really about identifying that single thing that you could do. And that. so that's, that's the planning stage of it. Then we go to the A, which is the army. And the army consists of influencers, and your super fans. Um, I always believe that the first thing in a business is to influence the influencer, right? And I always focus, I start there. So instead of trying to go out everywhere, I go try to find some influencers because there's nothing better than having an influencer talk on your behalf, right? The, it's really hard to go me, 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 but it's real easy when somebody else goes, man, Scott, you got to check out his thing. It's unbelievable, right? Right. That makes a big difference when you're out, especially in early stages of startup and you're trying to either go out and get funding or whatever. So I, I go out and influence influencers. And then the super fan, which is the like, especially in the, in the artist community, is we know now because of data. I love data. I'm a big data guy. Data changes everything for all of us right now. But the idea that... Um, the super fan we know will be roughly about 60% of all your revenue. And your super fan is if you've got a hundred thousand, let's say followers, it's one to 3% of your entire audience, those people. So I always say we need to identify the super fans, figure out value and really build them. And second thing about super fans is that, yeah, especially when you're an artist, a lot of times you want to build your business, but it really takes a team. It's very difficult to do it by yourself. You may think you can do it by yourself, but it really takes, it takes a team and it takes, you have to understand what you're good at, what you're not good at, right? I always say, are you a starter or are you a finisher, right? Which one is it? Are you a starter or a finisher? Me, I'm a great starter. I'm not the best finisher, but that's why I build, I always have a business partner who's the finisher, right? And he just kills finishing. He's not the starter. I'm the starter. He's the finisher, right? So, um, you know, go through and figuring out those fans. And, you know, when I did, a, I did an, a, an example of this, I did a work with Monty Python for about 18 years. And um, we did, uh, we built Python. Well, I, we, I produced all their games and all that stuff, but we did a, we did Python online and we did, it needed to do a campaign. And what I did was, as I said, Okay, it was for Life of Brian for the 40th anniversary. So what I did was I called, I I called, did a call to action to the super fan, to the 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 Python super fan army, saying I need bloggers, I need video editors, I need Photoshop guys, and I assembled about 25 of those guys, right? And virtually for nothing for that campaign, they created about 5,000 pieces of, of, of art and things for that campaign because they loved it and so they wanted to be a part fan, of it. it they wanted like. to be so part they were super of it, right? fan, yeah. And besides that, their passion for it is great. So I believe the super fan is a really critical portion to understand. When I could tell artists, who are your super fans that come to your gig? Okay, you know those guys come all the time. Do you know what they do? And have them go, well, I'm, I don't know. And I said, well, maybe one of them's a web a webmaster and the other one's a designer. And these are things that you can use and you can find out about these people. And you know, they're going to help you. So the army and your influencers is the A part of my thing. And the beautiful thing about that super fan is you get them involved. And what are they going to do when you launch your campaign? They're going to share it with their entire world because they co-created it with you. Oh, big time. I mean, that's why it's always important to go after those, those, those super fans, right? Yeah. You can identify them and understand who they are and understand your, your, you know, your influencers and the sphere of influence that's around you. So one of the exercises I give all the guy bands when I work and I say, well, okay, each one of you guys, who's your sphere of influence around you? Well, my dad owns a, a you know, a, a, a bank or something. I said, well, great. Do they do ever do any events or the things? How can you use that influence, that one degree of influence? So once you can identify that, that's a really important part of the, of that a part. Now, then we go to the C and that stands for conversion. And I try to explain to him that if, if it's going to be a business, it needs to make money. If it's not, it's a hobby. Now, it's fine to be a hobby. I mean, I love hobbies. Don't get me wrong. It's great if you want to go do it. And fans, and I try to explain to them, fans are one thing, but you need to turn those fans into customers because the goal is, is you want to get to a point where you get to do what you're doing every day without it. So I teach them about conversion, make them, make them understand that conversion funnels, right? There's What's so incredible is right now we have access to YouTube and Google. You can virtually almost learn anything by just dialing it in. Right. So, you know, I mean, I go and I, if I want to learn something, you know, I'm a guitar player and I want to go learn something, I'll go to, uh, you know, uh, YouTube type in, you know, how do I play this? Boom. And jump guy comes up and there's 10 people teaching me how to play it. So 
understanding how conversion funnels work. So I say, go out there, find out how they work. And so once you understand these processes of how to move a customer through a funnel to get them to the point where they're going to, you know, you know, sign up for your newsletter or buy your uh, widget or come to your show or download your record or whatever it is you want to make them do, understanding how conversion funnels work. So that's the C part. And then the third is E, which is the education, because everything I mentioned up there, you can't do unless you get educated, right? So it's all about you know, finding those resources. So I try to explain that every day, the artist, I say, you need to get up every morning and the first few hours, you need to be re reading blogs, following the leaders in your space and learning from them. And what's so beautiful is there's so many people that are teaching you like crazy. And there's great stuff that doesn't cost you any money. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, you can go to HubSpot and in HubSpot, they got a tab that's called the Academy. You go in there and there's hundreds of free eBooks how to use Twitter for business, how to write a successful Facebook ad campaign, how to do, and here it is, just incredible information. So it's really just about going out and learning. So that's basically the, the whole space model. And I want to say one thing too, about just the idea of what I try to explain to everybody. We're at a different time right now where it used to be these giant wide networks. We're now moving into hives. You notice people are moving into groups, things that they like. I, I always say, if you want to survive, you got to build a hive. And that's really the space right now. So it's really, uh, it goes around the whole idea of the uh, Kevin Kelly, you know, from Wired years ago, coined this term called the uh, thousand true fans. And he describes a true fan as somebody that will spend $100 a year on you. Well, if I have 1,000 of those fans, there's my first 100 grand in revenue. So I try to teach all these artists that we don't go big. We go small. We go small, man. It's about going small, finding those people. And I even say the first 1,000. I say, let's get that first 100 people to do something. We have a repeatable process, and they keep coming back, and we get that going. And once you have that, you can then start to scale from that place on. So I'm a big proponent of you know, the lean startup, the thousand true fan model. And I just think this is the greatest time I've ever seen in my life as a sort of a serial entrepreneur to be an entrepreneur, because there are more problems to solve right now. And the tool sets we have, and don't forget, dude, bandwidth, storage, and horsepower has changed everything, right? We hit a power band where all those things kind of hit at one time. Worldwide broadcast network in the palm of my hands. Twitter, a 24 hour cocktail party. I can go build audience. I can do all this. So we have all the tools. They're cheap too. It's like, it's not, it doesn't cost anything. So anybody can be in business today. And, you know, I think the opportunities out there, and I want to just throw out to your, the, the people listening that I think everybody needs to really pay a close attention to crypto and the blockchain, because I think we're right now at that precipice where we're going to start switching to a new system here, especially when you look at the Fed and the banks and the central banks and kind of all the debt. And you look at fiat currency, which is just dropping like crazy. I look at Bitcoin as the uh, global savings bank. Oh, you sound, right? like our, you sound like our son, Parker. He bought I mean, Bitcoin when it was 800 bucks about four years ago. And he said, Dad, you got to get in on this stuff. And what is it now, like 47,000 or something yeah, like yeah. that? <laughs> but, you know, more importantly, there's an incredible amount of opportunities that are coming out of that. I don't know if you've been watching the uh, NFTs, you know, non-fungible tokens, yeah. what's going on in that market. And the artistry. So the, the artistry yeah. that's starting to go to it. And just if you really understand what the blockchain represents as a technology, whether it'll be the exact blockchain or whatever comes out later on, but the, the concept of a ledger and, you know, and you start looking at currency. And if you think of Bitcoin, it's basically... A, it's like a, it's just eats fiat currency. Like I get money in my fiat account, man, I slide it right over here because it's not deflating like the yeah. other. And especially when you're looking at, uh, you know, even it's 50,000, that's nothing to where that could possibly go when yeah. you talk about 20 million coins. Right. So yeah. I think for business people, they need to really start thinking about those, those types of areas and start learning and following. And that's, you know, you got to stay on top of it. Technology changes like every 90 days, right? It's incredible. Scott, final question for you, because sure. that whole Bitcoin subject is a whole other show. Um, yes. Space, what is your purpose? My purpose is 
to try and wake more people up. I believe that only everybody's purpose is one thing and there's nothing else. I need, nobody does. Everybody does the same thing. And that one thing is to help consciousness unfold. Going back to that inner journey and becoming aware, that awareness and really, truly not understanding, but knowing. You can't understand what it means to be awake or what it means to be aware, right? You can only know it. It's a totally different thing. The words are pointers. They point to a space. So that journey changed my life so dramatic. I mean, so dramatic. I have no fear anymore. I just, because I know that I don't believe you die. I just think that this meat suit goes away and you move on. I could tell you that and you could understand it, but until you know it, it's a different thing. So for me, I, all I care about is getting people to try to take that inward journey because I think that's the most important thing. And that's our one job on this planet is to help it, help it, help it unfold. Yeah. Well, Scott, thank you so much for being here today. This has been an absolute pleasure. <clears throat> I love your passion, your energy. I don't even have to say anything. I just let you run the whole time. How oh, can people learn more about you? Where would you like for them to go? Well, my social is all I A M Scott Page. I am Scott Page on all the platforms and or go to think exp just google think exp and you'll can see some of our shows and think x my band and all these uh you know the shows we live shows we've been doing and then we're getting ready to launch Livin.Live, which is our new business model for entertainment that basically uses live entertainment the aspect of two-way real-time streaming and delivery service so we've combined that all into a new in entertainment experience which is killer. And I'm very excited about that. So you can find me, you can go to livn.live, learn a little bit about living. And you can also uh, just Google Think EXP and I am Scott Page and you'll find me. And, you know, <laughs> if you want to hit me up on a, I talk to everybody. So just, you know, hit me up if you have anything you want to say. Oh, I love it. Scott, thank you so much for taking your time being here. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Park, for having me. And I am so glad that you were all here with us on this journey today with Scott. Uh, just absolutely fantastic conversation. If I can be of service to you, come on over to the business of story where I can help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. And with that, if you love this show and what Scott has to share with you, share it with your world, friends, family, colleagues, anyone that you think might get a, you know, a boost out of listening to Scott and some of his brilliant ideas and how he applies his musicianship in a much, much bigger way in the entrepreneurial world and in life in general. And I love that concept of presence. And I hope you will bring your presence back here again next week when we will have another story artist like Scott here for you. And until then, remember that the most potent story you'll ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening.